So, so good morning, everybody. Welcome to the fourth day of the Blue Innovation Doc. All right, it's Tuesday already at the boat show. Feels like Friday, but um, it's always the, the same with boat shows. Welcome everybody here in the audience and online. Um, today um, we will talk about future fuels. And from 11 to 12, we have our first panel, developing and integrating alternative fuels. After our lunch break, a second panel, putting in place charging and alternative fuel infrastructure. Um, for my first panel, I have um, five guests here on stage. I call them one by one. First, uh, we have Algara Castle, Managing Director, E-Fuel e -Fuel Alliance. She said, no, that's not true, but she will tell us in a minute. Welcome, Algara. Thank you. Take a seat. Second guest is Bart Hellings, Director of Good Energy. Welcome, Bart. Please join us here. Then we have Sveta Ukonen, Head of Marine Fuels and Services, Nest Communi Corporation. Hi. Welcome, Sveta. Maybe you sit next to me, then we have a... <laughs> oh, here, this one, this one, Sveta, this one. This one? Yes. <laughs> Stefano Pagani, Head of Research and Market Intelligence, Confindus Confindustria Nautica. Nautica. Yes. So... And Paolo Bertetti, R&D Vice President, San Lorenzo. Welcome. Thank you. So, Welcome. the last days, we started these panels always with a short presentation. So everybody tells the audience and the online audience, okay, this is who I am, this is uh, who I work for, and this is why I'm sitting here somehow. Um, do you want to start, Sveta? Comfortable? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, good morning to everybody and uh, thanks for invitation here. Uh, very great to be here with, with, with my co-panelists co and, and the audience. Uh, I'm Sveta Ukkonen and I'm coming from Helsinki. I'm working uh, for a um, global producer of renewable diesel, uh, originally a Finnish-based uh, company, uh, Neste. And uh, nowadays, uh, Neste is a um, uh, number one leading company in providing uh, renewable solutions. Uh, we are uh, at the moment providing biofuels and uh, we are very well known uh, for our bio solutions for road transportation, renewable aviation and polymers and chemicals. However, I'm representing uh, our marine business and uh, in our marine business we have different uh, fuels, uh, mainly for uh, bigger vessels, uh, ferries or cruise lines, uh, then uh, global uh, solutions uh, for uh, deep ocean vessels, and we are, we are very much elaborating. We have a couple of solutions, uh, biofuels, and of course working very much on the future on e-fuels as well. Thank you for having me here. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, Paolo? Hello, everybody. Uh, Paolo Bertetti, Vice President R&D San Lorenzo Yacht. We are a company that is producing uh, yacht uh, starting from uh, 42 feet up to 72 meters, so a quite uh, wide range. We are very much interested uh, in the new fuels uh, because uh, from our side, uh, definitely the sustainability is not just a word, it's something that we like to lead and it's something that we like to push on the market. And uh, renewable fuels or new fuels or e-fuels are definitely one uh, big slice of the cake uh, that we have on the table. So it's uh, really one point uh, where we have to spend uh, time to think about <coughs> the introduction, <coughs> because at the end, uh, I think that the major point is to bring that uh, in an effective way on the market. So we are here. We are a quite innovative company. We are not the only one in the yachting because we have uh, even Germans and Dutch that are uh, working a lot on that. So I think that is uh, really today a good uh, 
day for making the point where we are and what we have to do together to be more effective. And uh, just to, to uh, your market position, it's not one Italian shipyard, I think it's the biggest single shipyard. Yeah, so. I would say worldwide we are uh, between second and third position in terms of turnover. We are quite a big company, we are uh, at the stock exchange in Milano. We are quite strong, but not the, let's say, Uh, we have many competitors that are, as us, uh, leading the development, so we are in good company. Thank you, Paolo. Um, Agara, you can correct me now, just to... Thank you, it's all yours. Right. So, also, first of all, thank you uh, for having me here. Well, actually, I'm replacing Ralf Dima, the managing director of the EFUEL Alliance. Um, I'm Agara Kassel the head of EU affairs of the EFUEL Alliance. And maybe just a few words to the EFUEL Alliance. So um, we are a reasonably young association um, founded during the pandemic, so 2020. Um, and we already represent more than 170 members, um, companies, businesses, associations, along the value chain of um, e-fuels. So uh, from the producers, from startups, uh, from producers like Nesta, actually, who's um, a member um, and a very ac active um, member of our alliance, to um, manufacturers like Siemens, for example, um, to the um, demand side. So like um, the automotive industry or, um, or the off-road sector. So, um, so this, is quite, this makes us quite unique that we represent the whole value chain from the supply side to the um, demand side. And if you have any, uh, yes, and what we want to do is basically to create business models For, or, or to make e-fuels, the production of, um, of e-fuels like a business case. That's why we have identified certain particularly EU um, um, dossiers that are right now um, in the make because of maybe you have all heard of the Green Deal and we have identified three to four um, regulations and directives um, that are right now under discussion and we think um, These are the possibilities with the right um, policy framework, actually, um, e-fuels that will be needed anyway, but um, can, um, um, can seriously become a business case. And if you want to know exactly what e-fuels e is, maybe we can discuss this during the, the, um, the panel. This, uh, this will be one of my first questions, just to have everybody at the table. Uh, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, Bart, maybe you introduce yourself. Absolutely, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bart Hellings. Um, I work for a company, a Dutch company called Good Fuels. Um, Good Fuels is, uh, was founded in 2015 with actually the mission to accelerate the energy transition in the marine sector. Um, and we do that by bringing fuels and solutions to the marine sector that we can already work with today. And that means that today we work with biofuels, renewable fuels that can be applied in today's engines, today's fuel infrastructure. So we have a running business uh, today in, um, uh, in the Netherlands, in Singapore, in Norway, in Gibraltar, where we fuel ships, uh, boats with sustainable fuels every single day, uh, making impact already today. I think that's very important. For us, it's really important to not only talk, but actually also do. Um, What, our company, what makes our company, I think, different from, from other fuel suppliers is that we are really founded to, to change the energy mix. So we are not just a fuel supplier, but we're really, we're really trying to improve, uh, improve the fuel mix. Um, and if you take our, our approach to sustainability, um, sustainability of renewable fuels and, and biofuels is pretty, pretty complicated. So we decided to not solve all that puzzle <coughs> ourselves but involve NGOs, involve universities, academics to help us form and, and change our, our opinion about that. So these academics and NGOs that decide which fuels we supply and which ones we don't. And that makes sure that our clients will always stay on the right track and basically do the world a favor uh, when running on biofuel. 
last thing that sets us apart, I think, is our research team, uh, where I think at this point, six, seven researchers work on a number of research projects to create the next big fuel of the future. Fuel made from wood, fuel made from sewage sludge, fuel made from lignocellulosic sources, uh, things that are not commercial yet today, but that we need if, re if really uh, we want to, uh, if, if, if the adoption happens, if we, if we scale the adoption of, uh, or the, the use of fuel. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. And uh, here just on the, from me on the right, um, Stefano. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm Stefano Pagani. I work for the Italian Marine Industry Association. Uh, I work on the technical side, on statistics, and I am the link with, at international level with uh, our international federations like ICOMIA and uh, EBI, European Boating Industry, at European level. And, um, you know, Italy is one of the leading countries in uh, yachting. Uh, we are number one for super yachts uh, manufacturing uh, with half of the mark of the global market. Um, but we are also leaders in uh, the production of large rapes, rigid inflatable boats, and among the, 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 the most important uh, manufacturers for equi marine equipment. Um, then Italy is also an important um, area, coastal area for yachting during the summer. And so uh, we can see the whole supply chain of the industry, even at the tourism level. And uh, I think that it, when we talk about sustainability, it's a need that the industry is uh, understanding in these years and that's why it's a strategic keyword for all of our manufacturers and operators. Um, one year ago we, uh, we created a working group about sustainability within our association, uh, transsectorial, so we've got people coming from um, yard manufacturing, boat building, equipment manufacturing, marinas, etc. in order to have a global vision about the needs and uh, problems that can happen within our world in this phase of transformation. Um, and so we think that we will have to cope with a lot of disruption in how industry thinks for the next years and we have to uh, be clear in our minds what will be the path to get to these objectives by 2035, 2050 at European or IMO level uh, in order to be ready uh, to make the changes we need in t on time. But I think we can yeah, understand yeah, yeah, better yeah. later. Absolutely. Um, but uh, uh, Stefano, just tell me how many companies are you somehow representing? How many members do you have in your You know, there are really a lot of companies in Italy. We've got uh, around 500 members uh, in nine different clusters of uh, manufacturing or services. Yeah, okay. But there are really a lot of companies in Italy, in Europe, and uh, so we work for everybody. Yeah, yeah, I understand. It's the same here in Germany or in Holland and so on. Um, when I left home uh, this morning, my kids were asking me what I'm doing today. Yeah, I'm at the boat show. Okay, and exactly what? Um, yes, I have a panel here this morning about alternative fuels. I said, oh, okay, but we are just <coughs> using, you know, E10. So what are alternative fuels? Maybe, um, Aga, you can bring us here, everybody. At the same on the same level, what kind of e-fuels are existing at the moment? What are we talking about? Okay, yes, thank you. So basically, when you talk about alternative fuels, you mean an alternative to fossil fuels, like to so uh, the normal um, um, petrol or diesel, the fossil-based one that you're using now, can be basically replaced by alternative climate neutral uh, sustainable fuels and this can and normally you do um, distinguish 
between basically two main um, groups. One is what um, Sveta already um, 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 introduced, uh, bio-based fuels. Um, and the other is, which is quite new, or it would, which will be the future, is e-fuels. And e-fuels is, um, the e basically stands for electro, because um, unlike, uh, unlike um, biofuels, E-fuels are synthetic fuels, so you have, so you need a synthesis process. And um, the E is, um, the electro stands for the renewable electricity that we use at the very first step of the process. So to gain the um, renewable hydrogen via electrolysis. And for this process, we need um, electricity. Uh, but it's only, but e-fuels can be only sustainable and climate neutral if the electricity is renewable. Um, through the electri um, electrolysis, you have um, um, H2, so hydrogen, and then the synthetic process, um, it depends what kind of fuel you need at the end. Uh, it could be fissure drops or it could be like the e methanol route, um, you combine the renew your renewable hydrogen with uh, CO2. The CO2 you can either capture from the atmosphere or, or it can be a biogenic source. Um, so this is, at the end of the day, you have uh, basically e-fuels. And it is an alternative, it is a drop-in alternative, it can basically replace um, your normal um, fossil fuel that you are petrol or diesel that you're using now, but it saves up to um, 90 or even more percent of CO2 emissions. So this is why it is like the sustainable and it is the way forward and particularly the future because biofuels, we will always need them because we just need the amounts for what is lying ahead of us. We basically have to phase out fossil fuels and this is quite a lot what we have to, this is quite a long way. But um, um, the charming thing about uh, e-fuels is that they are scalable. So when you're looking to biofuels, they will, we will reach like a plateau in about 10 years time, I don't know, and they will be part of it. But to really close the gap, we will need um, scalable fuels, and this is uh, what e-fuels uh, can do. I hope that was clear. I try to explain it at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very good, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, but Sveta, bio-based, um, so you are doing only this, or can you explain how do you do it? What is the process behind? I mean, maybe lots of people hear it for the first time, here in the boating. Sure. Uh, a couple of words about Neste. Uh, Neste is driven by uh, creating um, a sustainable future for the next generations. So basically we uh, made a huge transformation from being a traditional uh, refining company to being a leading provider of renewable solutions. Um, we are also stock listed in, in Finnish Stock Exchange and I have to say that this transformation journey has been very long. We were uh, uh, among the first ones who introduced um, renewable diesel, second generation renewable diesel and it happened already more than a decade ago. Uh, we very much um, believe in this future and actually if you give a look at the share uh, it, it, it was quite a journey so it, it, it was it, it was you know a proof that uh, really society is transforming and green values are really part of our DNA but then if we go to this biofuels so what are the biofuels uh, in order to produce biofuels there are several technologies uh, Nesta is also an engineering house we have our own technologies 
and uh, we produce uh, uh, our solutions in, 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 in different locations. We started in Finland, then we have also production in Netherlands, in Rotterdam, uh, production in Singapore, which we are very much, uh, very much expanding now, uh, and also we have a joint venture in California. So in order to produce a renewable diesel, uh, we need a sustainable uh, renewable feedstock. And currently, 92% uh, of our feedstocks are of waste and uh, residual origin. So it means that, uh, for example, we have several contracts with um, um, McDonald's or different other restaurants from where we gather uh, used cooking oil. Then we have um, contracts with slaughterhouse from where we uh, gather uh, animal fat in order to uh, produce biofuels. Uh, then we can use fish fat and then we can use also different vegetable oils. Uh, so, um, in order to produce biofuels, we need this waste and residue, uh, which has to be sustainable. And how to make sure that it is sustainable? Uh, all our feedstock is third-party audited. So, there are different um, com companies. For example, our feedstock is usually ISCC or ISCC Plus audited. So, it is very, very uh, important uh, because in order to be sustainable it's all about having a sustainable uh, certified feedstocks uh, having a production in a sustainable way but also in order for uh, customers like for for yacht customers or for shipping companies uh, to reduce emissions there has to be sustainability bookkeeping uh, that means that this uh, like you know uh, it called like bio criteria uh, the sustainability criteria it has to be properly documented uh, and like in a bookkeeping it has to be sold to one party only one time so that we make really sure that it's uh, it's used only once not twice and that this company uh, is really making true impact. Uh, but yes, in short, in order to produce biofuels, uh, we need uh, sustainable renewable feedstock, like different waste and residues, vegetable oils, and then with diff different technologies and with different sites, you, you uh, process them, and uh, what you get out uh, will be uh, biofuel. Okay, and uh, Algara mentioned, okay, there's a plateau within the next... 10 years because then it's uh, the material let me say is has reached uh, the high the highest yeah that that's true so um, uh, there is a limit for uh, used cooking oil for example of fish fat and animal animal fat we we we, we can't eat um, unlimited amount of french fries in order to get uh, to get uh, used cooking oil so uh, for, for biofuels uh, uh, we at nesta as uh, this biofeedstock is really important to produce those then of course we are uh, constantly looking at different um, to increase um, the pool of different feedstocks to onboard a new novel feedstocks uh, we believe for fa for some feedstocks uh, there will be a plateau but then at the same time we believe that there is a a lot of routes which are not explored at the moment. So, for example, some of the uh, waste and residue is really, really poor, and you can't, it, it can even contain some, uh, some traces of some um, unwanted uh, materials, and we can't produce them because the, we, don't, we, we can't damage the, the engine, which is a very crucial part of, of yachts, and of course, especially in a big ship's engine is super expensive. So what we do, there are two paths. We are exploring new, novel feedstocks, and then we are also uh, exploring technologies to deal uh, with very poor quality of feedstocks to utilize those existing ones even more. And, uh, and uh, at Nesta, we still believe that uh, with biofuels, we unfortunately can't save the world uh, because the same solutions go to road transportation, to sustainable aviation. So we need uh, to uh, increase pool of, the f of, of feedstocks but there are opportunities. So uh, we have, um, we have, uh, we are exploring now third generation uh, 
feedstocks and Bart already mentioned some of those lignocellulosic so from the wood industry uh, will play a very uh, important role uh, then we are investigating for example municipal solid waste what to do with that uh, then we are exploring algae. So uh, we have even a very interesting uh, project to cultivate algae, like seaweed, uh, and uh, uh, to, to, to get oils from that also uh, to enable uh, production of, of biofuels. Uh, for the biofuels, the good thing is that they are drop-in solutions. So actually, uh, uh, they can be used in existing uh, yachts, boats, uh, ships. And uh, of course, it also like prolongs the lifespan of the existing uh, ships, yachts, boats, so, so those are like excellent, excellent in that sense, like you know what it is, it is safe to use, there is legislation, safety standards for those fuels, so of course, and of course there is like technology, you don't need to, to build um, a new plant. Uh, so at Nesta we, we believe that uh, there is, um, that biofuels will play an essential role. Uh, there is still a potential to significantly increase production. And actually, this is what is happening at the moment. And uh, this year, more and more new producers uh, came and uh, introduced their biosolutions as well, which is very good for, for this community yeah. and, uh, and uh, for, 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 for boating and shipping industry. Yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, uh, but um, I read about a little bit your working history. You to have the link now to the shipping. Um, I think you are active already in the commercial shipping industry with your <coughs> company. So then we get the link later on to yachting. But I would like to start. How is the situation in the commercial? <coughs> you see that in commercial shipping, indeed, we. Uh, yeah, I think that. Basically 100%, 95% of our business today is commercial shipping. So that's big container ships, big bulk carriers. The cruise segment is picking up now quite rapidly. And what you see there is that the customers of these uh, carriers, basically, they drive the demand for, for green fuels and for decarbonization in these, in these ships. And that is, of course, in this segment, uh, the, the, the end uh, uh, consumer is basically the beneficiary. So there... A, a, a push needs to happen and where the, the push in the end for commercial shipping comes from for example the IKEA's, Heineken, uh, DHL, these kind of companies that, that really want their goods to be transported in a, in a carbon neutral way. Um, since, yeah. since when is this happening already in the commercial? We have, uh, we've started our company in 2015 with bringing an existing fuel to, to ships just to prove the case uh, that, that a biofuel works in a ship in that case, it was Coast Guard, Navy, um, uh, Port Authority vessels. Basically, you always need to find someone that, that, that that's also what I just meant with DHL. You need someone to, to pay the bill for a more expensive fuel, someone who has an interest in doing that. Um, and in that case, these were governments that wanted to help us in, in proving the point that this is a feasible solution. Well, that was 2015, 16, 17. And in 2018, we used all the knowledge and, and, and references that we, that we created to uh, fuel the first seagoing ship, a big, I think, 200 meter long bulk carrier with 100% biofuel. Uh, really marking the point, a uh, big BBC News thing on uh, this can actually be. Uh, but that was a mega big ship with a big two stroke marine engine that can burn very nasty fuel. Um, and that's different from all the, the, like the beautiful boats that you see here. Uh, but what is important is that with these steps, you, you, you show that this can be done. You also accelerate basically the supply chain of feedstocks, the previous discussion we had, so the raw materials that you need to make a fuel from, the, the producer side. You need to accelerate that entire chain basically from the, from the end where it's being consumed to, to allow investments upstream. So basically what we created now is a system that consumes fuel with end consumers and burners that actually burn fuel which allows us to invest and to co-invest and to work together with upstream partners such as Neste uh, uh, to produce more and to increase uh, volumes and to also increase the business case for unlocking more technologies and unlocking more feedstocks. I think the previous discussion in the end for me very much comes down to a commercial discussion too. So to what extent is it feasible to, in, a, in a commercially sound way get these feedstocks that you need to make a biofuel from out of the 
remote places that they, that they are. I worked for myself, for example, I worked in, in Tanzania on biofuel production in a biofuel factory. Well, Tanzania is a pretty big country with one paved road. Um, if you want biofuel feedstock to come to that factory in an efficient way, it's very costly. Um, and that goes for forest residues too. Well, imagine if you need to take, uh, well, any kind of, uh, of, of, of weird feedstock that is sustainable because it's a residue, uh, to a plant to make a, to make a biofuel from it. It can be done. I think that that cap is pretty far away in terms of actual availability, but making it happen in a commercially viable way is, uh, is, is probably the, the real challenge. And at some point you will see that e-fuels are actually more cost effective than, than a biofuel if you need to make it in a really difficult way. Okay, but the, this first ship you mentioned, did they have to change something or just you... You fill it in and thank you, off we go. Or is, it, uh, is there a technical solution needed on that ship? Now, basically, <clears throat> none of our clients need to adjust anything to the ship. Mm -hmm. not, to, not to the ship, not to the fuel infrastructure, not to the storage. So we always use everything that is there. Um, and and that, is, that is something that our clients, often in first or second meeting, find pretty hard to believe. Like, this ship was designed exactly as you started for running on a fossil fuel. How can it be that I can suddenly just 100% change this and everything will still work? Mm. So that is, that, that is something that, is, uh, that, that takes some, some, some convincing. Uh, but these showcases, and I think since 2018, we've built quite a number of those. And that, of course, helped. Like, you need to get the first few uh, early adopters uh, doing it. And then, then, then it starts taking off. And we see in commercial shipping that is actually taking off now. Uh, we started the yachting segment, um, I think, a year ago um, with, with first conversations with uh, yacht builders. Uh, we executed the first few deliveries to yachts now with biofuel that went uh, successful and smooth. Uh, so these cases now also in this industry are extremely important to showcase that it can be done. Yeah, yeah, especially, uh, Paolo, in the, in the yachting, right? Is it somehow, in my opinion, I'm here for 20 <coughs> years, a bit conservative, would you be... An early adopter? Are there clients who are asking for, for Let's this? Let's say solution? we have to divide uh, the scenario in two parts. The first one is what they call, what we call drop-in fuels. In that case, uh, the major issue is uh, from one side having the engine manufacturer saying, uh, OK, you can use it. Mm -hmm. Some is already there. Volvo Penta, for instance, is already saying uh, you can use without any issue. MTU is coming, but not all are today advertising that uh, these drop-in fuels can be acceptable without any doubt. So the Why? first point... Why? No, just because they are conservative. They like to test it uh, and then they release. You know, in terms of warranty, if you have a blown uh, engine, it's a big yeah. issue. So they like to be very conservative, but I, I understand. So mm -hmm. drop-in fuels... First point is having uh, the engine manufacturer saying, OK, you can go. Then the second point is availability, uh, because uh, basically you have to refuel. And then third point, uh, there is not yet such a wide knowledge from final clients about these fuels. So on that, uh, definitely we have to work a lot. But drop-in, let's say, is a simple issue. Then when we talk about uh, alternative fuels, that can be methanol, can be ammonia, can be hydrogen, then the picture is much more difficult. In that case, we can have uh, some interest. Uh, so clients come in saying, oh, OK, what do you know about that? But then before committing themselves to buy a boat that can run with methanol, for instance, just even for uh, uh, hotel load, so not main uh, engines, but just uh, hotel load, then it takes time. Because in that case, uh, the additional point is, uh, are we sure about the technology? So can we do that without risks? And uh, in that case, the answer is, uh, step by step, we can convince them, uh, but we have to bring in the water what we call pilot applications. And because one point is to discuss and talk, blah, 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 but it's not sufficient to convince them. Another point is to show them 
There is a boat there, 50 meter. You can go on board. You can see by yourself that we are using methanol with a fuel cell. So the point is then to convince someone to act as a pilot. You have a project like, like this? We right? have a project. In that case, to be very clear, the pilot is the owner of the company. So Mr. Perotti is very much interested to bring on the market a solution like that. So he decided, OK, my new 50 meter will have a fuel cell from Siemens Energy that is working with methanol for the hotel load. We are doing that. We'll be in the water 2024, so not far away from now. And other yards are doing the same. So there is not a lot of clients that are ready, but someone can be picked up. They must be brave, because so far we can give them promises that it will work, but they are the first one. So uh, I know that uh, uh, we have Lursen that is working with a client with the methanol. I know that uh, Oceanco is developing that. I know that Fedship is developing that. So it's not just uh, San Lorenzo. Others are running. Yeah. It's not simple. It will take time. Yeah, absolutely. And and the 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 clients, the customers, are they actively asking already for alternatives? Um, some of them. Uh, very uh, cool. I would say one of their ten is uh, having knowledge about that, uh, and uh, is knowledge that is enough to stimulate uh, curiosity and to ask. Others. Maybe some captain, uh, because uh, captains are much more uh, informed about that, so they can ask. Uh, but uh, really, to tell you, there are many clients ready. Uh, it's not yet like that. But I think after we have one, two, three different yachts from different brands that are operative, then it will be easier. At that point, the point will be availability again. Uh, because uh, that's an important issue. And that can make the difference between a theoretically good uh, fuel, e-fuel, that will not be successful, and another one that will be successful. For instance, hydrogen, in my view, is very good uh, for certain applications, small one, or where the range is not much. Uh, but availability of hydrogen in the marina will be a nightmare. Take in mind just a few numbers for you. The break-even point for cars and trucks, so the filling station for hydrogen, is today between 50 and 60 tons a year. In UK, there, are, there is Shell that has opened years ago refilling the station for hydrogen, but there is no demand. They are closing now. You have to reach 50, 60 tons. And on a marina will be even worse because the cost will be higher. So, in my view, hydrogen in the marinas, I have, I'm quite skeptical that in the medium term will be a solution. Methanol could be definitely much better. And then uh, e diesel, in that case, is not an issue. But the point is, again, Availability and then even cost from that point of view. Yeah, and and Stefano, I mean, it, Italy is a hub of yachting worldwide. Somehow, in, what are your members discussing? And you said, okay, we have to in advance before we started here, we have to find a solution <coughs> before someone else gives us borders. And okay, we have to be ahead of time, right? Yes, it's right. In fact. European Union with the Fit for 55 uh, and uh, IMO with new uh, ideas that they are working on um, think that decarbonization is uh, the future, obviously. And we are aware of that and we are ready to, um, to start this path for the transition to a decarbonized fuel world. But we have to be really objective. Um, let's understand what is the yachting world. In fact, we will always have to think about two different worlds. One is the future, so we need some 
pioneers like San Lorenzo, for instance, that are thinking today what will be the future. As we are a, a niche, we are a really small, small industry within the maritime world. And so we cannot lead the way in some way, but we have to follow ideas that are already applied somewhere else. And uh, so we have to think what will happen in the future in all the segments of yachting, but also what will happen in the future for the existing fleets. Just in Europe, we, will have, we, we, we have millions of boats. In North America, the same. So what will happen with these boats? So drop-in fuels are maybe one solution, because you can think about changing or uh, stopping the possibility to move for uh, millions of boats that do not last 10 years like a car, but they can last 30 or 50 years. So this is really strategic to understand what will happen for the existing fleet and what will happen for the future yachts and boats. For the alternative fuels that Paolo mentioned, uh, obviously we have to try um, and we have to be objective in fact because if we look at the average use of engines in our world it's really small because we've got uh, an average use of 50 hours per year for outboards and maybe <coughs> 200 or 300 hours per year for the bigger yachts uh, used for charter, for instance. So, finding a balance between the use, and so if we look just at the carbon emissions, we use the automotive fuels, so gasoline and diesel, not the heavy fuels of the commercial ships. So, the emission of carbon is really slow because we've got modern engines today. And so, as we have small spaces on board, not all the solutions will fit for every segment of boats and yachts. So the needs of a sailing, yacht, a sailing boat are different than the needs of a super yacht or of a power boat or of a day, uh, day boat. So we have to think about a segmentation of our sector and we will not we will not never find a single solution that, feel, that fits all the vessels and all the types of yachts and boats. So this is an additional difficulty that we will have to face. But for the smaller boats, already today we have electric solutions where the range is not a problem. But for yachts like explorers or super yachts that need to have longer range, this is the difficulty. Hydrogen will be maybe a so the solution one day, but you know, the volumetric density of hydrogen is 10 times more than the, the diesel one. So where do you, ca can you put all this hydrogen in a yacht? Maybe in a ship, in a commercial ship, you can but not on a yacht. So Metanol could, yacht. could be one of the transition systems that we can use waiting for other solutions or maybe waiting for new generations of batteries in 20 or 30 years that today we can even think about. Yeah, uh, Paolo, is this, um, is this an issue because you need for some alternative fuels, you need more volume and I mean, the client, in my opinion, says, okay, the engine room as small as possible because I want more space for my guests. Absolutely. And so, so let's say we are selling yachts uh, for the accommodation space, not for the space in the engine room. So from that point of view, whatever is the fuel, the new fuel that we are going to use, we have to minimize the effect of additional volume because that is needed. Uh, uh, Diesel fuel is the best from that point of view. So whatever we are going to use, it will be 2.5 times the methanol in terms of quantity, four times uh, if we go with uh, uh, liquid hydrogen and so on. Batteries would be 50 times. So the point is really 
whatever we are going to change, uh, we have to find the best balance because we cannot uh, simply stretch the size of the boat just to put inside more fuel. We have in some way to consider a reduction of the maximum speed or the cruising speed in order to avoid to have really huge tanks, but that is in our way feasible, even because we are now very well aware how the yachts are used and uh, we have a lot of power on board that is never used. So basically, we can reduce the capacity of the tanks, not simply multiplying by 2.5, we can have some effort. But definitely, the space will be an issue. And if we have liquid fuels in some way, if we are talking about hydrogen, as it was said for him, on a yacht, either you have a 150 meter yacht with plenty of space, otherwise uh, on a 50 or 70 meters yacht, uh, liquid hydrogen is a nightmare. Mm, I don't see. Forget the availability. Uh, forget the shadow boat is a new business case. You're building a shadow boat following the yacht. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But one point that I would like to mention is not only the space on board, and that is a point that is important for you. You have to understand how the yachts are used. Uh, because as it was said by uh, my friend uh, Stefano, yachts are used uh, for a very limited uh, amount of time every year. How many? The average, let's say, if we're talking about a fiberglass yacht, so between uh, 80 feet to 100 feet, uh, probably they are using between 50 to 100 hours of engine a year. That is really peanuts. If we are going on a bigger yacht, uh, could be 300, 400 hours a year. What is the point here that you have to take very in mind? Uh, one point is using a drop-in fuel on a car or on a truck that is used every day. But uh, the effect of aging, uh, is not there. The effect of aging is on the yacht because you refuel at the end of the season, sorry, at the beginning of the season, and then you will have that uh, in the tank or a part of that still at the end of the season. So it will be maybe eight to 12 months with humidity, with heat. So what is going to happen? Can we have jelly at the uh, bottom of the tank that then is creating a big issue? I don't know. But uh, in the past, uh, with, uh, uh, let's say, um, biofuel that were added to the normal uh, diesel fuel, that was an issue. Yeah, but maybe so the point is, uh, new generation, <laughs> please, take in mind that is not like a truck, is not like a car. It's a fuel that will remain in the tank for a lot of time. And it must uh, be still good uh, when after 12 months you start again and you try Yes, to I'm, I'm very interested to hear. Maybe, Svet, maybe all of you. I mean, you will have uh, the same or a different answer. I don't know. Probably the same. Uh, good news that we have a solution. So I think, I think what, what uh, so this is exactly, I, I absolutely relate like what you're talking about. So maybe two points here, like first of all, when we are discussing like if use for yacht, I, 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 I just have to say that, you know, if use, it's a really now like really fancy topic, uh, but we really have to think like where to use it. So uh, now when we have different solutions and also like even sectors which are using which fuels, road transportation is the most polluting way of transport. And that is why 70, over 70% 70 uh, from transportation emissions are coming from the cars. So that is why uh, traffic, uh, road traffic has been regulated for uh, tens of years nowadays. And in different EU countries, there are different mandates how much of energy has to be renewable in the cars. Uh, now when we go to yacht, as you say, it's 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 very limited amount of hours of engines that is that is 
that is used. So for the cars, there are different types of these bio, uh, bio drop-in solutions. Uh, for the cars, uh, very widely first-generation biodiesel is used, and this is um, uh, it has different quality. So it can be very low quality, and there you can have uh, different uh, bacteria growth and different problems. So this one is not for yachts who, who are uh, who are in use for very limited time. Uh, then there is another like second generation uh, renewable diesel called HVO, HVO and this is what Neste is producing so this is the good news for yachts uh, when we started to produce it in beginning of 2000 uh, of course we made a sample and we are keeping this sample in a warm uh, storage uh, to see how it will change and now uh, almost 20 years later is the same <laughs> so 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 this is the good news it's really it has to be like high premium quality uh, fuel and and this is exactly like you know when when um, it's it's also like uh, you know there are, there are different solutions and there are different companies and some companies you know there are more like you know cowboy set of of mindset they just want to get uh, very um, uh, you know as as cost competitive as possible uh, different types of molecules and mix those together so for for the yacht definitely it has to be a, a reputable supplier eni is very good like in Italy um, there are lots of lots of companies uh, who are producing now the HVO so HVO yeah. is the solution for uh, for the yachts good okay perfect thank you Agara is the same um, same answer somehow or well I mean when it comes to these technical issues I just have to um, to trust our members the producers yeah. that they will find a solution but just thinking of it um, or or about it with e-fuels at least I can't imagine what obviously you have to adjust it and and it had to work but you don't have the bio component where you might have an issue with bacteria that much that you have with um, a biofuels so I assume not being a technician I assume that with the e-fuels you will have fewer problems when it comes to this uh, issue Okay, and uh, uh, but maybe then, and then maybe answer to yeah. Paolo, and and then I would be interested in how uh, how are your first yachting clients? What what are you doing with them? What is their experience? What is their feedback? Yeah, I can only uh, indeed uh, copy what Sveta has already explained. Like we we supply indeed to yachts, to boats, we supply HVO, um, and and indeed if you if you leave that sitting there for years and years, it will be the same. Of course, and it's, it's basically a higher quality than diesel fuel, and that should be, I think, the, the reference point. With every fuel, if you store it in a tank in a humid environment and you keep a, a little nice layer of water on it, then probably bacteria will grow in the water. Not in the fuel, but in the water. So with every fuel you use, good housekeeping is still, of course, important. Also with HVO. And what is, I think, important if we, if we find this challenge important to, to, to change the fuel mix, is that we, we, we focus on the actual issues if they are there and, and not be too distracted actually by, uh, by, for example, bacteria growth in water due to, uh, for example, poor housekeeping. Um, and for the rest, I can, I can really relate to, you need to, to be careful and precise on which fuel suits which application. So yes, for yachting, I would always go with HVO, but if you would go back to the previous example where our business is now, commercial shipping, it's nasty fuels, dirty fuels, indeed first generation, well, generations is hard, but let's say traditional biodiesel from uh, sustainable feedstocks, it's harder to, to manage on board, but the commercial ship has 30 people in the engine room to manage that. So that's fine for that application, not for a yacht that basically uh, does a few hundred hours a year. Um, sorry, your question? The second the question yacht, was yeah. the first, the yachting uh, uh, clients, uh, what is their experience, their feedback? Um. Yeah, incredibly smooth, I can only say. So the, um, there is of course, a, a, I think the biggest challenge is twofold, um, to get someone to pay for it, because also still in the yachting sector, also in the super yacht sector, there are still cost targets. Um, what are we talking about? How well, it differs per geography. For example, if you would uh, fuel a yacht in the Netherlands, it will come at a, at a, at a premium of maybe a few hundred euros per cube of fuel. Um, 
and so, but in, if you go in the mat where there's no incentives whatsoever available for that segment, you could easily talk about doubling or tripling the fuel bill. And that is, that is very relevant also for a super yacht owner. Uh, so that is challenge one, find a few early adopters to actually pay that bill and to, to show that it is important and to basically set a new standard. And challenge number two is to get the fuel there. Um, because if, especially for those first few uh, early adopters, it will always be an incredibly inefficient supply chain to get the fuel to the yacht. And you need to force local marinas, fuel suppliers, logistic operators to do something specifically for your sustainable fuel operation. And that's, of course, a lot of work. Uh, and you need to be able, you need to work together to do that. Stefano, how uh, the situation in Italy? So many boats, so many cruising grounds, so many producers. Uh, yes, uh, we, we've got all and we can understand well which are the needs and which are the problems. And uh, I think that it's important to understand that the yachting sector is a really big community with different actors. And uh, talking within uh, some working groups with maybe marinas, uh, maybe uh, operators in the services, maybe um, uh, yacht builders, is really strategic because uh, you can do your, well, your, your job without knowing what the others are doing. So the distribution of fuels without marinas will be impossible. So we have to uh, understand well how we can organize in the future this new uh, distribution of, I don't know, hydrogen, methanol, or everything else. Um, and this will not be made without the collaboration of every operator. And uh, we are lucky, in fact, because our community is, uh, as I told you, is very really large and uh, united. So uh, we've got ICOMIA, which, which is the international federation, with many technical working groups on uh, technical problems, sustainability, uh, how to grow boating. And uh, so we can discuss and understand the problems. And uh, as we are a small industry, we have to find the right way, the right path for the future, because otherwise, it will not be possible to, uh, to get to 2050 in the right way, in a sustainable way, and we want to be a sustainable industry. It's going to be difficult, but this is our direction and it's our strategy. Perfect. This is, a, in my opinion, a good final statement. We are really on time. It's a boat show. You have probably other appointments. Thank you all for coming. It was very nice. Um, and interesting, I can report at home now what I was doing here. Um, thank you very much. Yeah? Have a good show. Can I add one point? Sure. Uh, I think that we have to join the efforts. Uh, IMO can have a strong influence on what will be the future of new fuels. We have to be in front of IMO with a matrix of... Uh, sorry with a matrix of possible usage of fuels for different areas of the business, from small boat up to super yacht. We have to be proactive. We have to bring them a proposal so that they can push, they can support, they can uh, simplify. Otherwise, uh, the risk is that uh, IMO is deciding to go in the direction that will not be consistent with what we need to do. So the point is we have to put together the efforts. Yes, absolutely. Now you can take your call. <laughs> and, and you exchange all business cards here, so we are on the right way. Thank you.